there. I think. Yeah, we are ready to go. There you we go. Very happy to have on our bench racing hotline the man who is uh, of leisure now, Dr. Dick Bergren, joins <laughs> us. <laughs> Hi, Doctor. How are you? Uh, anything but on leisure. Uh, I'm here <laughs> in uh, Dayton, Ohio right now, getting ready for a production meeting and in anticipation of tomorrow night's prelude to the dream. Yeah. So although I've retired from Fox Sports and from uh, doing the every Sunday afternoon pit road reporting, uh, I'm still involved in automobile racing right up to my eyeball. There you go. That's absolutely the best way to be. So you're about, uh, let's see, we were figuring this out by the way the crow flies, about 140 miles south of us right now, as a matter of fact. So uh, both in the Buckeye State. And that is one of the great races. Uh, Charlie, as a matter of fact, went down there a couple of years ago to the Prelude to the yep. Dream. And, uh, boy, you don't talk about something that has just grown and grown and grown. That is a beautiful racetrack that Tony Stewart's done a great job with, but the race itself is just terrific. Terrific. Well, the thing of it is that there are drivers from numerous auto racing disciplines that show up here to participate in the event, and none of them race dirt late models as their full-time enterprise. Right. Some of them spend a lot of time on the dirt. Uh, as a good example, certainly uh, Kenny Wallace is the winner of the very first ever Prelude to the Dream, and he'll run 40 or 50 dirt track races over the course of this year. So he is one of the more active of the drivers, but we got some interesting stuff going on this year. Steve Kinzer, who is the winningest driver in the history of Eldora, has never driven a dirt late model anywhere. Mm -hmm. He has entered in this event, as is Donnie Schatz. Those two guys are currently first and second in World of Outlaws sprint car points, but they will be out of their element in these dirt late models. So, too, Cruz Pedragon is an annual visitor here right. at the Prelude to the Dream. He's a drag racer as is Ron Capps. Capps currently second in points at NHRA Funny Car Racing, where if you were to turn left in the middle of the race, <laughs> you'd have a horrendous wreck. But uh, here at Eldora, you've got to turn left at least twice and slide the car as you do so. But perhaps more eyes are going to be on Danica Patrick than anybody. Uh, she hasn't even been to a dirt track for years and never drove anything other than a, uh, a go-kart on dirt, and that was back when she was a teenager. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's going to be an interesting event with some people who are very good at this stuff, like Kenny Schrader, who will be participating here, and Clint Boyer, who's never finished out of the top five in all of his appearances here. And uh, Boyer raises a good bit with dirt light models. So uh, it's going to be quite a challenge for the rookies, uh, quite a challenge for the veterans to be able to steer their way around these rookies as well. Dick, what's the uh, what's the, the 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 smack talk like between all those drivers from different uh, different disciplines and something like this? Do you get a chance to get a flavor for what they're talking about between them? Um, are they are they helping each other out? Are they talking a little bit of smack? What's going on? Oh yeah, no, they they help each other absolutely. It's in everybody's best interest to help the other guys. Uh, the people who have not got a lot of experience with this stuff. Uh, they need some help, and, and they do look to the veterans, and the veterans are going to steer them straight. It's been that way all the way through since the prelude to the dream first began. Well, i got to give Danica. You know, Danica Patrick gets an awful lot of, uh, speaking of smack, she gets smacked around a lot by uh, people who say she's not prepared for what she does. But I give her an awful lot of credit for doing something like the prelude to the dream where she has absolutely – you know, no background in it whatsoever, but she does put herself in the situation where she's looking to, to increase her driver awareness. She's looking to help out the charity, of course, which we got to talk about with this deal as well. And, you know, you, you just look at her and say, you know what, she is she's putting herself in some situations which are not necessarily comfortable for her, and you got to give her credit for that, I believe. You know, I think so, too. And, and certainly what she's done in NASCAR Sprint Cup racing this year is right in that category. Uh, she'd had some experience at Daytona, so uh, running in that race wasn't as big a deal as it was to show up at Eldora, for heaven's sakes, uh, and go run a, a NASCAR Sprint Cup car at what is, for many, the most difficult track in all of big league stock car racing. And I thought she did a fine, uh, a fine job at Eldora. Uh, and then, of course, she shows up at the Coca-Cola 600 a few weeks later, and after running 300 miles on a Saturday afternoon on Sunday night, she goes an additional... 600 miles, and if you add to that all of the practice and qualifying that she ran, uh, she probably did well over 1,200 miles over a 48-hour period, and that's pretty tough sledding for anybody, uh, but if you're doing it as a rookie, it's especially so, and she is a rookie in NASCAR's top division. 
We're talking to Dr. Dick Bergren. Uh, Dr. Bergren, uh, you've, you're coming off 13 races, the first 13 races of 2012 in the Sprint Cup Series, covering all those. What's your feeling, on, uh, an overall feeling of the, the, of the season so far? Uh, anything surprising to you that you've seen? Well, there's a lot that's been surprising to me. I guess what has not surprised me uh, is to see uh, that 48 car and Jimmy Johnson doing as well as they are now doing. Uh, Johnson has had a pair of DNFs, a crash at Daytona, almost at the very beginning of the race, and an engine failure at Talladega. Were it not for those two things, uh, Jimmy Johnson, more likely than not, would be leading our points. Yep. And he is on one incredible roll after winning at Darlington. Uh, he comes right back. He wins the Sprint All-Star Race. Uh, and then uh, last weekend at Dover, he absolutely decimated the field. Um, we're not surprised to see Jimmy Johnson doing well, but to have a run like he has had in the last four weeks uh, is incredible. And, oh, by the way, and no surprise, Jimmy Johnson will be racing tomorrow night <laughs> in the prelude to the Dream, and he is a past winner of that event. Yeah. Uh, I guess the biggest surprise of the year, though, has been Kurt Busch and uh, the troubles that he has gotten into. Uh, I really expected, and I think a lot of us in the media had expected, that uh, he was going to calm down and, and uh, have a year in which there was no controversy at all surrounding him uh, at the racetrack, that the only thing people were going to be talking about was the brilliance with which he drives these cars. But he got himself into a jam at Darlington when he roared through Ryan Newman's pit, uh, got hit by NASCAR with a $50,000 fine, had a crew member ready to take his head off if he could. And now last weekend after the nationwide race at Dover, he gets into it again after threatening uh, a member of the media. Uh, and and it basically is not going to be able, allowed to race this weekend uh, by NASCAR. And uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a tough situation that he is in. He needs to sponsor desperately. He needs to prove that he can control himself in order to get back in the top level. And, and I, I just see him flushing his career down the toilet. And, yeah. and I'm, I'm disappointed in it and absolutely astonished that it's going on. Do you think that uh, this was his last chance? Some people are talking about the fact that uh, next Tuesday, supposedly, he's going to have his uh, meeting with James Finch. As, as Finch actually said, his come-to-Jesus meeting uh, with Kurt Busch. Is this the last piece of the puzzle for Kurt, or is, is he going to be able to find the Joe Gibbs of the world that is going to be able to, to tame him and bring him back? Was this the last go-round? Was this the last rodeo? Well... Kurt Busch is the one that's going to have to solve Kurt Busch's problems. He, he can't. He can't count on on Joe Gibbs or anybody else doing it. Uh, he flushed down a, a, a ride with uh, Jack Roush. He had a, a terrific situation there, where in fact he won the national championship. Then he goes to Roger Penske and flushed that one down. And now maybe even lowly 51 car with James Finch that may well be gone as well. I, I don't want to say never. But I'm going to say the level of difficulty of getting a sponsor to want to hook up with Kurt Busch at this point is extreme. Uh, I could imagine the sponsor not wanting to be involved with him because of his past run-ins with the media uh, and his past run-ins with other competitors. Uh, there may come a time and there may be a sponsor that, that will stick their neck out and give it a try, but Kurt Busch is probably not on the top of any prospective team or sponsors list of somebody that they want to hire. And it's too bad because I, but he's just a great guy 99.999% of the time. But when he's got that helmet on and when he's dealing with the media, uh, he sometimes just loses control and says things that later he regrets and has to apologize for and that hurt him dearly. Well, you've been doing pit reporting for a long time on television. You've been reporting on, uh, on racing for a long time. Is there one thing about pit reporting that uh, that has changed in the over uh, 20 years or so that you've been doing it is how has your job changed since you started it well the biggest thing that's changed is the technology uh when i first started there were races on uh the half on the half mile tracks where literally uh we were working with hard wire meaning that you had a cable that came out of pit road in the middle of pit road and you dragged that cable behind you as you walked up and down pit road trying to do your announcing. There were no scanners, so you couldn't listen to driver crew chief conversations. Uh, indeed, before that, there were even no, no radios uh, where people communicated with their drivers through the use of pit boards. And now, 
we've got all this modern stuff going on where everything is electronic. Uh, we are self-contained. I'm, uh, Pit Reporter is no longer hardwired to anything. You can go pretty much anywhere. Uh, and we've got the scanner, so we listen to the broadcast in one ear. We listen to driver crew chief conversations in the other ear. And, and the rest of it is the amount of information we had of it, we have available. When I first started, I kept all of my own statistics because there were no statistics other than an annual NASCAR record book that was produced at the end of each year. As the year unfolded, there was nothing. It was hard even to try to keep track of points and who was where. And now every driver with a sponsor has got a full-time PR person that cranks out public relations information, uh, mediates between the media and uh, his or her driver, and, and there's literally a mountain of, of information that's generated. If you print it all out before every one of these races, there's probably five or 600 pages, yeah. <laughs> 500 pages of information that you can go through, you can read, and you can incorporate in your notes. Big change from when we used to have to keep it all ourselves. So what uh, you, we alluded to it a little bit that uh, you know kind of made fun of the fact that uh, you are retiring. Uh, cough, cough, laugh, laugh. Uh, what do you have planned? Do you have some time uh, set aside just for you for a while? Well, I don't have any time set aside just for me. I do have time set aside for the dog, however. <laughs> uh, every year when I get off television, and we've been doing this now for quite a while, uh, we take the dog on her vacation, uh, and there is a a hotel that we go to that is dog friendly. Uh, they love to have dogs there. Dogs are encouraged. Dogs are in the lobby. They're at the pool. They're all over the property. Uh, and we're going to take the dog on vacation soon. And uh, we'll spend a couple of nights at a hotel and show her a wonderful time. And there's also a beach that they can romp on with no leash until 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, so I'll be doing that. Uh, and uh, as far as time for me, uh, I'll jump on the motorcycle and go for a ride on Saturday. Uh, there's a, a charity ride that goes around the biggest lake in New England, uh, and I'm going to do that for sure. And uh, sometime over the weekend, I hope to put my boat in the water, and I may actually go out in it. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope some of those dreams do come true for you. Uh, we've uh, really, really enjoyed uh, listening to you all these years, watching you on television all these years. And I'm sure, uh, as I think I read somewhere, you said that uh, every once in a while you might be able to be coaxed back if somebody you know can't show up for a weekend. That's true. All right. Well, the best of luck to you, and we will talk to you again yeah, in the future. And, and enjoy that race down at Eldora. It looks like the weather is finally going to cooperate. It's been a little rough the last several years down there, and you're going to get this one off uh, as scheduled and uh, enjoy it. We'll have a good time tomorrow night for sure. And, and, and for folks who can't get to Eldora, you can see it on HBO pay-per-view. Right. Just log on to HBO.com, HBO.com. And uh, you can sign up, and you can get to see it live as it unfolds. All right. All right. Thanks, Thanks so much. We'll talk to you again. Thank you. All right. Dick Bergeron, Dr. Dick Bergeron. And it's a, he is a, a doctor of psychology, and 